Somebody left a comment on one of my videos saying that it is only through the blood of Jesus that we will be saved, that we will have salvation. And he told me to read Zechariah chapter 9, verse 11. So let's read that verse and let's discuss exactly what this means. You too, with the blood of your covenant, I have freed your prisoners from a pit in which there was no water. So he told me, he said, the blood of the covenant is Jesus' blood. Now, as a Jew, we ask the question, where do we see Jesus mentioned here? We don't. We see that there is a covenant. Now, what is this blood of the covenant? Do we find this anywhere else in the scripture? And the answer is yes. If we flip over to Exodus chapter 24, verse 8, we will see this. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. And he said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has formed with you concerning these words. Now, what was the backstory here? The backstory is, is the Jewish people were standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, and they were entering into a covenant with God in which the Jewish people would accept upon themselves all 613 commandments. Moses and the people sacrificed animals to enter into this covenant, and Moses collected the blood in two separate portions. Half of the portion was put onto the altar, and half of the portion was sprinkled onto the Jewish people. This was the blood of the covenant, and it symbolized the unity of the Jewish people with God. Now, I don't always engage back and forth in the comments because I find it's not very productive, people who are engaging in the comments are usually pretty close-minded and it's hard to have a conversation there but I did reply and I shared this information with him and he replied back he said read still Isaiah chapter 49 verses 8 to 9 verse 8 clearly shows us this is his blood his meaning Jesus of course but your Exodus chapter 24 verse 8 says that is the flock's blood so let me rephrase his point his point is is that in the verse that we will see, it is in the singular form, it's talking about a singular person. Whereas over in Exodus 24, you're talking about an entire group of people. This is a covenant between the people and God. So he's saying there's a different covenant and this is illustrated in Isaiah because Isaiah is speaking about a singular person. So let's examine that chapter and see who Isaiah is speaking about. Ko'amashem, so says God, in a time of favor, I answer you. And in a day of salvation, I save you. And I watch you. And I will make you for a covenant nation. And then the verse goes on to establish a land, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. We're going to focus on. Now, this word, Betencha, is in the singular. It comes from the root, Nun Sof Nun, which means to give, to set, to appoint, to make. We're going to deal with those definitions in a few minutes, but first let's go back to the question, why is Isaiah speaking in the singular? So we have to ask the question, who is being spoken of in this chapter? So if we go back up to the very top, we go up to 49 verse 3, we see that God is saying, you are my servant Israel about whom I will boast. The word used there is abdi. Abdi means servant in the singular. What God is saying is, you, Israel, are my servant. All of you together, you're unified. You are my servant. You are one unit who are serving me. The verses then go on to speak about the servant who is going to be a light unto the nations, who is ultimately going to bring salvation to the world. You see, the role of the Jewish people is to elevate this world in the servitude of God. And yet, the nations of the world don't really love us very much. As Isaiah says, we are despised of men. Throughout the book of Isaiah, you're going to see Isaiah referring to this servant over and over and over again. And this servant, my servant Israel, is the same servant referred to in Isaiah chapter 53. And in fact, you'll see a lot of parallel language between Isaiah chapter 49 and Isaiah chapter 53. To be sure that Isaiah 53 is speaking about the Jewish people, you can go check out my video. We go into that more deeply over there. Back to Ve'atendcha. So this word is in the singular, but it's speaking about the nation. Now, here is where things get really ugly. We know that the correct translation is... I will make you for a covenant people. But let's look and see what the Christian translators do to this. If we flip over to the KJV, we see, Thus saith the Lord, in acceptable time I have heard thee, and in day of salvation I have helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. So the King James Version is trying to make us think of a person that is being given to the people as a covenant. That human being is the covenant. In the text, there is no definite article before the word for nation or people. So we know it is speaking about a singular nation among nations and not the entire world as the Christian translators wanted you to believe. There is also no preposition before people, so we know that nothing is being given to the people, but the people are part of the covenant. In order to achieve the Christian translation, it should have been written, Be'aten os chadabris el ha'am. And even though there's no blood mentioned in this verse at all, this person was trying to say that the covenant is one of Jesus' blood. Now, if we look at the NKJV, the New King James Version, it goes even a step further. 
Thus, says the Lord, an acceptable time I have heard you, with a capital Y, obviously to give it prestige, to make us for sure zoom in and focus on Jesus. And in the day of salvation I have helped you, I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. It is a crime. There is no capital letter in the Hebrew language. They are trying to make you think about Jesus when Jesus is not anywhere in scripture. The smartest thing that you could do is actually to go back and to read Isaiah chapter 49 from the very beginning and get a feel for who Isaiah is speaking about, who God is speaking about in this chapter. This entire chapter is about the nation of Israel returning to God and you know, being redeemed by him, coming back to the land, the ingathering of exiles. Focus on verses 12 to 14, which say, Sing, O heavens, and rejoice, O earth, and mountains burst out in song, for the Lord has consoled his people, and he shall have mercy on his poor. And Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and the Lord has forgotten me. Shall the woman forget her suckling child from having mercy on the child of her womb? These two shall forget, but I will not forget you. You see, God will bring his people, his covenant nation, back to the land of Israel to serve him in the end of times. And though we have been despised by the nations of the world, there will come a time when the nations are going to wake up and say, oh my gosh, what did we do to the Jewish people? And in those times, the nations of the world are going to come to the Jewish people and they're going to say, teach us about God, for we know that God is with you. Now we have to ask the question, what is the catalyst that will actually bring back the Jewish people out of exile? What is the catalyst that will redeem us? And the answer is found 10 chapters ahead in Isaiah 59 verse 20. And a redeemer shall come to Zion and to those who repent of transgression, Jacob says the Lord. It is the repentance of Jew that triggers the coming of the true Messiah. Now, what does it mean repentance? It means going back to the covenant that we sealed at Mount Sinai. We entered the covenant that day. We said, we're going to do all of your commandments, God. While Christianity says that a person is only redeemed by God through the blood of Jesus, the book of Isaiah tells us something very different. Over in the very first chapter in verse 27, it says that Zion will be redeemed through righteousness and justice. It is through fixing our behavior, through caring for the widow and the orphan and caring for the destitute. It is through doing all of God's commandments, both in our heart and physically, that we will be redeemed. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 7, God is crying out that the Jewish people are not keeping his laws. Return to me and I will return to you, he promises us. We're in a relationship with God and we have to feel love for God and we have to do the things that he loves as well. And moreover, we have to love the people that he loves and we have to take care of them. God loves works. God loves our mitzvahs. God loves the fulfillment of the commandments. He loves when we care for other people, when we work to make this world a better place, and when we do the things that increase our relationship with Him. There are two vital components to serving God. There is the commandments between us and God, and there are the commandments between us and man. Both of them are extremely important. Isaiah chapter 40 begins with God comforting His people. He says, Nachemu, Nachemu, Ami. Be comforted, my people, be comforted. Why? Because the exile is going to come to a close and the Jewish people will be atoned for through their sufferings. We have suffered so much and though we pray for a day when the sufferings will very quickly end, they served a purpose. They purged us, they purified our hearts, they caused us to recalibrate, to come close to God. Nowhere in the Bible we will find that it says that our atonement will come through the blood of Jesus. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we can have atonement through the death of another human being doesn't work that way. Full atonement is returning to God. It is getting rid of all idolatry. It is leaving behind foreign ideologies. Isaiah chapter 27 verse 9 tells us that Jacob's sin will be atoned for when all idolatry is removed from this earth, when the Jewish people return to God and to keep his commandments. But it's not just the Jewish people that God wants. He wants all of the world back. He wants to be in a relationship with every single person. And in fact, back in Isaiah chapter 49, God said it's not enough that just the Jewish people should come back to him. He wants the salvation to extend to the entire world. And his salvation plan does not include the blood of anybody. The destruction of idolatry goes hand in hand with the redemption. So let us renounce foreign ideologies and return to the God of Israel, the creator of the world, who loves us and who created us to serve them, and who definitely wants our works. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. On that day shall the Lord be one, and his name one. Hashem echad, Ushmo echad. One, not three.